Different Families, Different Dances, Children of Alcoholics in the Classroom, a professional development workshop presented by Dr. Ann Roberts from Radford University on October 29, 2014. We're going to go ahead and get started. I have about 55 minutes to, uh, for this presentation, and I'm really, really excited to uh, share some of the information I have about this kind of a unique population uh, that you might find in your classroom. You may not even recognize that. Um, so I'm Ann Roberts, and I am the coordinator for secondary social studies here at Radford University. If you want to be a social studies teacher, I'm your person. And uh, in addition to that, my background is I'm also a substance abuse counselor. Uh, that was my first career before I was a teacher. Um, and I was a uh, student assistance counselor in Hampton, Virginia, which means I was full-time in a middle school and I was working with at-risk students who were at risk for um, uh, becoming involved in alcohol and other substances. Anybody from the Tidewater area? Anybody? Okay. It's not that Hampton is, was so problematic that they needed full-time counselors. They actually were on the cutting edge of an extremely um, broad, uh, forward-thinking program, and I loved doing what I did, but I knew that it would always be there because of funding. So um, it was at that point after that job, I decided I wanted to be a teacher. And so I came back here uh, to Radford University and got my master's in the social studies program back in 1994, and then ended up being a middle school social studies teacher. Uh, I was there uh, at uh, in Montgomery County for uh, eight years and then got my doctorate and came here. So let me just ask you, who is elementary, interested in elementary couple? And how many have it for secondary? Okay, secondary, and can I ask? PE. PE, health and PE, which is a great thing too. My so, husband's a PE teacher. Uh, <laughs> my husband's a PE teacher. <laughs> so what we're gonna do today is, uh, my goal is to help you all um, kind of think through the type of students that you might have in your classroom. You may never know their background, but yet um, students have come in with all different types of um, uh, different file folders of, of who they are and what they believe in and how, how their lives are shaped. And it might give you a little insight of who might be sitting at your tables when you're a teacher or who are, who are in the desk as your teacher. Now, I want to just lecture because that's really, really boring. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about this whole dynamic with what is it about um, children who come from a parent who is alcohol dependent. Now, we really are talking about a lot of things. It's anything that takes that child, that parent, away from providing for the needs of a child. Uh, it could be uh, addiction to other substances. It could be a severe illness that they are so shut down that they really aren't providing for the needs of their kids. Um, it could be a, uh, an injury that happened that really wipes that parent out of being doing the parental things. Um, but what we're looking at is a child who is trying to make sense of their family and their place in the family, and they're trying to figure out how to take care of the family and also get their needs met. And so the first thing, and so when I'm talking about children of alcoholics or of people who are alcohol dependent, I'm really talking about a, a much broader topic, but I'm just going to narrow it to that, that topic of when a child is um, raised by a parent who's out of commission because they're focused on their, um, their uh, substance, which is alcohol. The other thing I want to tell you is that we are not talking about a deficit model, that there's something wrong with these children. It's just a different dance. That's all it is. It's not less than. We all, uh, and here's my first assumption, do you agree with this? By virtue of being raised by parents, wouldn't you agree that everybody comes away with a little something that they got to work on? Because <laughs> parents are human and they make mistakes. Maybe they're a little quieter than we like. They don't show as much affection, or maybe they seemingly are more uh, in favor of one sibling than another. Or maybe when they get angry, they kind of, you know, are a little bit uh, overwhelming. But we all come away with something in our family. And so I would argue that it's just the same with the children of alcoholics. And the second thing I want you to think about is, um, would you agree with me, this is my other assumption, that uh, parents, the main goal of parents, if they have children, is to provide for the needs of their children. Food, shelter, clothing. They, they teach you a lot of things. They teach you how to communicate. They teach you what constitutes love or how to get angry or what does it mean to be a, a man or a woman.
woman or what does the what does work look like? They really model and teach you a lot. Would you agree with that? Okay. So what is it that happens when a child is raised by a family member who is supposed to be providing a lot of those needs, but because of their addiction, they're sometimes more focused to one degree or another on the addiction rather than providing for the needs of the family. Now here's my last thing I want to say before we get started. In order to help you understand this phenomenon and what it means to teachers in the classroom, um, I want you to know that I'm going to be doing some kind of flat stereotyping a little bit. That really, being raised in a family where there is an alcoholic parent is very complex. There's so many variables that influence how that child was shaped. Think about it. it. It would depend on how young was that child when the parent was really out of control with their drinking. Because a really young child has different needs that need to get met versus a teenager. Was the parent who was out of condition because of alcohol, was it because they were, did it manifest in anger and maybe violence? Or were they actually somebody who was very kind and, and cranky when they're not drinking? Did that child have other siblings that helped provide for the needs for that child that the parent didn't provide for? And so maybe they had a different type of resiliency. Does that make sense? So that there are a lot of these variables that happen for children who are in homes where there's an alcoholic parent. But even with all those variables, we do see some themes that emerge that are kind of consistent to some degree or another. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an overview of what it's like to be in a family. But then I want you to understand that in addition to that, sometimes students take on roles. And these roles are kind of shaped as a result of the alcoholic. But it's also shaped on them trying to figure out how they can help the family and how they get their needs met. And for that part, I'm going to need some participatory help. Any questions before we start? So this is what I want you to understand. Again, we are not talking about the, this, these children who were raised in this family environment. They're not less than. They're actually very resilient. They're very clever on figuring out in the event that they're trying to navigate this parent who is unpredictable, they do very clever things to get their needs met. But even saying that, Children often take the blame. What did I do wrong? If I didn't sass back, if I kept my room cleaner, if I got better grades, maybe that parent would stop drinking. So they have the illusion that they have enough power to control that parent's drinking. And there's a lot of shame for it. They feel shameful like that they, that because they take the blame for it, they feel ashamed at who they are. So oftentimes they have low self-esteem. A lot of times, because that parent is unpredictable, they don't know what, quote, normal is. They never know what they're going to find in that family arena when they come home. Is the parent going to be kind of quiet and receptive? Are they going to be agitated or out of control when they come in? Sometimes in a family where there's an alcoholic, you could go in and say, hi, mom, and all of a sudden they blow up and you did nothing. And so you never know what to expect in that family of origin. And therefore, oftentimes, you keep friends and support systems out of that family system. You don't want to bring friends over. So oftentimes, you can be isolated at home because of the unpredictability of that family dynamic, that family environment. Um, you learn not to trust what you see. Mom, why is Dad passed out on the couch? He's not passed out. He's just sleeping. Don't you say that. Don't you dare talk about your personal family stuff with anybody who's public. So we learn not to trust what we see. Gosh, Dad drank a 24-pack. I can't rouse him. He smells like alcohol, but he's just sleeping. Okay. And you're constantly getting challenged of what your senses are, how you feel, what you see. And so you learn to kind of shut down your feelings, and you learn not to trust your emotions. Why is not mom ever come to my family events? You know, she always says she's going to, not family events, my school events. She always says she's going to come, but then she never does. Your mom works hard. She loves you. Okay, I'm always being disappointed, but this is love? Okay, you kind of get all these very, very, very messages. 
you, turn, you tend to want a lot of control in that game of origin because you're working hard to get your needs, needs met. So sometimes children of alcoholics can be very controlling. And as far as connecting to others, they, they struggle a little bit about that because their primary connections where they should learn those connections with the father and the mom, they're having some difficulties. So sometimes what that does is it manifests into they aren't, don't quite feel safe with other family dynamics or other friend dynamics or how they relate to other people. So they tend to kind of keep to themselves. They're always feeling guilty like they caused stuff. They're always saying, I'm sorry. There's chaos a lot of time in those families. And they have to navigate through that chaos. And they almost, if there is a lot of chaos in that family, they almost seek that chaos because that's normal. They might create a little bit of that chaos because at least they know how to navigate it. So sometimes that's kind of a byproduct of being in that family. Whether they know it or not, they might seek out the friends who have a lot, a lot of drama and dynamics going on that are kind of uh, crazy. Okay, so that's just kind of the climate. But in addition to that, because of that, we have kids who are, um, who oftentimes become roles in the family to help the family get their needs met. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to do what's called a family sculpture. And what that means is it's, it's almost a counseling technique. I'm going to ask six people, which is all but one of you, so you've got to participate. All but one of you, I need your help in creating this family drama. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to, it's going to be about a dad and a mom. The dad's going to be alcoholic. And I'd like the dad to be a male and the mom to be a female. No offense. The kids can be either gender, but it just makes it simpler that way. Um, not that it'll, but anyhow. Um, uh, other family structures are okay, but we're going to be typical. I'm going to tell the dad's story. I'm going to situate him in the room. I'm going to ask him to say one. I'm looking over here now because this is my male gender table. I'm going to ask for them to say one line over and over again, about five, six times. I'll tell them to stop. I'll bring in the mom. I'll tell you her story. I'll situate her in the room. I'll ask her to say one line over and over in his line, and then they'll be in concert with each other at the same time. Then I'll bring in the first child. I'll tell you their story, situate them in the room, and then I'll just keep adding people. So it's going to be a mom and a dad and four kids. Okay? Any questions before we start? Okay. Who would like to be the dad? I won't make eye contact at this moment. I don't want to bully you, but you all can kind of. That we were thinking rock, paper, scissors for a second. <laughs> rock. Yes. Okay. So you stand right here. Rock, you were born and raised in southwest Virginia, the coal mining area, and your daddy was a coal miner. And um, you had some younger siblings, and you, you loved your family. But the only catch was your daddy, he drank a lot. And by the end of the month, money was really, really tight. And what you used to do sometimes is take on extra jobs to kind of fill the family coffers so that they wouldn't do without. Dad was never physical abusive, but he had a bad mouth on him, especially when he'd been drinking. And you often would get between him and the rest of the family, and you took a brunt of a lot of that. You excelled at everything. You loved track, you loved basketball, you um, were fabulous in school intellectually. Um, you, any competition as far as debates or, or essay contests, anything, you did everything you can. Um, because you realized three things raised in this family. The first was that someday you were going to create the family that you, didn't, that you wanted that you didn't quite have. The second is you knew through hard work you could make better of yourself in your family life and what you had. And third is you knew that alcohol played no part in your life. So you worked really, really hard. You got scholarships. You ended up wanting to go to Virginia Tech, so you weren't too far from your family. And you studied engineering. Uh, you were kind of a loner because you were working so hard for the family, even when you were at school. You worked hard, you had jobs, and the one thing that gave you comfort and solace was being outdoors. You loved the outdoors. You loved kayaking and hiking and camping. And your senior year, you decided to give yourself a gift. Finally, after all those years of hard work, and uh, you decided to go to the Everglades. You'd never been down to Florida, and there was this cooperative venture between Virginia Tech and Radford. And it was a 10-day trip, 
you headed on down there, you sat in the bus, and this young lady was kind of near you, and you struck up a conversation. And before you knew it, oh my gosh, you were chatting like you knew each other.